So we heard from the Commissioner that we are experiencing troubled times in Europe, that a recession is possible to avert a recession, but that it also might come our way. Um, from the ECB, we're waiting to see what can be done from financial stability. Will it be enough to convince uh, the markets? And uh, on the long-term prospects, we are hoping for proposals this year by the Commission to review the economic governance. Let's see what those hold in place. And um, the Commission is not uh, um, scaramantic, so he won't give a prognostic, but I think that there will be a deal in, uh, in uh, Friday, at least that's what we reported this morning. So let's see what that leaves us. Um, I wanted to tell you to just stay here for the people in the room because we are having a little sponsor segment by Dr. Martin Brudemoller. Welcome, Martin, uh, which is named Under Pressure, Europe's Competitive as a Crossroad, uh, sponsored by uh, the European Roundtable for Industry. Please come on stage. Thank you. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, when you talk about competitiveness, Maybe sports is a very good reference. This is why I would like to start off by taking you back to 1994. That was the Olympic Winter Games that took place in Lillehammer, Norway. But 1994 was also the time when mobile phones became very prominent. So it's not a surprise that at that time, with each Olympic result, you could see actually the heads of states, the dignitaries, the diplomats standing there with their mobile phones and calling home, reporting, sharing, and celebrating actually every victory of their country. And among them was at that time also the then first lady of the United States, Hillary Clinton. So when actually the American athlete, Tommy Moe, surprised everyone by winning the gold medal in the ski downhill race, Hillary was thrilled. She took her phone and tried to call home. So she was standing there with all the others in sub-zero sub temperatures and tried to call home, but it wouldn't work. So a little bit irritated, she asked her staff, what's going on? I want to call home and I see all the others calling home. Why doesn't it work? And the answer is actually very simple, because the global networks have been on GSM and her own phone was on the US telephone system CDMA. So this story tells us two important things. The first one is, it's all about connectivity. Europe um, managed at that time to include all in one um, network that was across borders. So it was not surprising that this was adopted globally. And so GSM, and you might better know it under 2G, made the race and became global standard. And it was dominating mobile telephony at that time. The second point is maybe even more important because 1994 was also the dawn of consumer information age. And that was actually the time when we were in a moment of step change and Europe was far ahead of the game. So, but what happened next? Actually, it was in the same year in July when Amazon was founded. And it was 1997 when Apple was pulled out of bankruptcy. And then the years after, it started to flourish and transform itself. Apple was founded, uh, Google was founded in 1998. And it was just one year later that Alibaba Group was founded. Each of these companies has built up a business that was based on services relying on connectivity. And each of these companies also made it prominently to take a position in all of your lives and in the global Fortune 500. So did you observe anything more than that? Yes, none of these companies is actually coming from Europe. So despite the early um, win that Europe took in defining the global standard of GSM. It was in the world of 3G, 2000, when Europe lost the lead. Now you might ask yourself, how could that happen? 
how, it, how could it actually be happen that Europe has defined a global standard and then is missing out and losing the lead when it comes to implementation of the technology and capturing all the benefits from it? Well, the answer is relatively simple. It was a lack of com connectivity and it was also a lack of opportunity to scale up. Europe has decided for a fragmented way of installing this um, technology. And even some governments have considered and focused more on optimizing the revenues out of their 3G auctions than having the big the picture in their mind and thinking about and imagining a world where you take benefits from global connectivity. The, the European market was too fragmented at that time and partially it is still today. So there is one lesson here. Even if you invent the game, you still can be outplaced when it comes to implementation. And right now, we are living in one other of these moments of step change. Just think about the digital and the green transition. With the Green Deal, rightfully so. The European Commission has the ambition to be a front runner in this and defining a position in a better sustainable future and even including targets of digitalization, circular economy, and carbon neutrality. So the key question is, is there actually a risk that history is repeating? Could it actually be that we in Europe define another global standard, but we miss out when it comes to the implementation and harvesting the goals, uh, the, 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 the benefits from these innovations? And I guess, ladies and gentlemen, the answer is yes. So, what I would like to take you to is give you some insights of the benchmarking report which we have released today from the European Roundtable of Industry or Short in ERT. This report of European benchmark of industry and competitiveness is giving valuable insights and it compares our industry with those of the US and of China and with some others. So what does this show us? First of all, the Chinese turned the table on us in the last 20 years. So if you look at that, they have actually been tremendously successful and they have taken away the market share of Americans but also the European companies. And they have kicked us out of the Fortune 500. They have been tremendously successful to stepping up their numbers and they kicked off 50%, almost 50% of the European companies that have been part of that list. And there is one other moment where we are in a step change when it comes to new technology platforms, and I'm talking about AI, about artificial intelligence, which is so incredibly important for defining our future production. Even there, if you look at unbelievable, but it looks like we make the same mistake again by not investing enough in this tremendously important infrastructure to keep up the pace in the production of tomorrow. Then we come back to connectivity. Today is about 5G and fiber networks that defines how successful you are in the hyper-connected world of tomorrow. And unfortunately also here, you can see compared to other regions, we are too slow, too hesitant, and not bold enough to build up the infrastructure. Even now with electricity, where you would say we are in a geopolitical turning point of energy, and all in the middle of energy transformation, even there, it looks like we are falling behind the other regions in investing enough and in investing in a pan-European infrastructure. When you then see, on the other hand, there is also some glimpse of hope, which is in the production of technology manufactured goods, because that's an area where Europe has hold its position. So there is a chance that this part of the world will capture an even bigger share in the future and maybe also position in the global Fortune 500 
in five years to come. So where does this leave us? Oops, oh. So where does this uh, leave us? Ladies and gentlemen, it comes all back how we pursue on our competitiveness. It is not that we don't have ambitious, um, ambitious ideas. There are actually enough. If you just think about the green and digital transformation, if you think about the Fit for 55 climate goals and even the EU CHIP Act, they are actually all promising visions. Don't get me wrong. But it is at the very end about the question how we are going to implement this. And this is, we have to make them a reality. And if we want to have to do that, then we have actually to realize we can also only do that if we all pull together. All have to work together. It's about Team Europe. If we want to have a strong EU, which has independent resources on energy, digital, and information, and innovation, there's no escaping from the fact that we have to work together and build those capacities here in Europe together. And actually, ladies and gentlemen, it's about investing and innovating. Otherwise, we are history. So, but the question is where to begin, actually. And uh, it is very much about strengthening the single market. This would clearly benefit our society. It would benefit our economy, and it would even make us more resilient to external shocks. Just think a moment when you think about a deeper single market, what that could do, actually, to an energy union, to a capital markets union, and to more cohesive digital services to actually the EU citizens. There are many promising EU initiatives out there. Just think about, again, about connectivity and innovation, but also thinking, think about the European alliance when it comes to industry data, edge, and also the cloud. At the very end, ladies and gentlemen, it is all about then coordination and an accelerated delivery, what makes the difference. And at the very end, I think it is an Olympic spirit which we need when it comes to European competitiveness. If we, if we talk about competitiveness, it is about investing in the future. It is about intensifying our strengths and also identifying our weaknesses. Is it about the spirit to get better and better and also to be ahead of the game once again? And this is about taking opportunities. It is about advancing and being also a team. I mentioned that. It is about working together between business, policy makers, government, but let me also say the wider society in general. We have all to work together to make that happen for one common goal. And this is a viable and competitive Europe that is well connected with the world. So I guess what I could show you here is some teaser, some taster for the report. But if you read it, I can promise you it's a cold shower. Like a cold shower that wakes you up in the morning before you go to the training. So when it comes to our report, which was launched today, that is giving you a, a good overview about what it is in competitiveness in Europe. It gives you a good idea what the strengths and the weaknesses are. And it also sets the priority, which we have to do and which we have to go for in order to cope with the other regions and uh, also having a place again on the winner, winner's post list. So please take the opportunity, go to ert.eu and download the full report and take your cold shower. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brüdermüller. And I would just like to um, invite you back in about 10 minutes for a panel discussion where we'll have some really interesting speakers to dive into the RRF, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, and into Europe's recovery. So take a quick break, but be back in 10 minutes, please. Thanks. This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Mm -hmm.